Uh, so my name is Daniel Jackson. I'm a professor in EECS and a researcher in CCEL. Uh, and I'm going to talk about how to design software. So here are the two questions I'm going to start with. First of all, what does innovation in software look like? And secondly, what makes a software product successful? So let's look at some scenarios of success. And I use this well, word scenarios advisedly. So let's start with uh, an example of a great success, Tim Berners-Lee's uh, World Wide Web. So what was novel about the web? So let me tell you what wasn't novel. First of all, the technology certainly wasn't novel. If you look at the technology that, uh, that Tim developed his first prototype of the web on, it was pretty advanced stuff, even for back then. He had almost a gigabyte on his hard disk, he had this fancy Next computer. Oh, I'm blocking the screen. Thank you. Um, where shall I stand then? How about over here? Is that better? Great. Um, so, um, you know, it had built-in Ethernet connectivity. So all the crucial elements of functionality were there. So technology was certainly not, uh, an, not an innovation. What about the fundamental ideas? Well, the idea of hyperlinks. Well, that had been there in HyperCard, in uh, Bill Atkinson's product in 1987. In fact, hypertext itself had gone back many years before. That was invented probably in 1967 in, in an editing system that, uh, that Ted Nelson and Andres Van Dam built. Um, arguably, the whole notion of a hyperlink collection of documents goes back to Vannevar Bush's a paper in The Atlantic in 1945, where he describes this fantastic machine called the Memex, which was a kind of you know, mass of you know, knowledge that you could uh, navigate by taking a, an elaborate path through this labyrinth and so on. So these ideas weren't new. The idea of markup wasn't new. HTML was a new markup language, but it was based on SGML, which had already existed uh, for several years. And finally, the idea of moving files across the network, well, that wasn't new either. The file transfer protocol was very well established. And at the time of the World Wide Web, people were already downloading papers you know, from each other's sites and so on. So what was new? So I'm going to argue that something incredi incredibly simple was new. And, and it was in the scenario by which this downloading happened. <clears throat> so when you used an FTP server, here's basically what you had to do. You had to identify your server S. You had to open a connection to it. You had to set a directory, you know, find the right directory inside that server. And then you could request the particular file, any number of files you wanted. And then you could close your connection to the server. And the way I'm describing this scenario, these red bits are all the annoying bits, right? Because you just wanted those files. So why did you have to do all these preliminary things of going to the server and opening the connection and closing the connection and so on? So Tim's solution was, well, why not simply have a single request that says, get file F1 at server S? And of course, this idea in retrospect, like a lot of great ideas, is completely obvious. And of course, that thing there, that address, S slash F1, is just a URL. And so what this means is that the real innovation of the web was, in fact, the URL. It was the idea of having persistent names for resources and being able to request the resource at a particular, with a particular name in one step. OK. Second scenario, the iPod. What was novel about the iPod? Well, of course, it was a super slick device, but its design was not its novelty. I'm sure many of you have seen this before. It's been pointed out many times, famously, that Joni I's beautiful design of the iPod was based on Dieter Ram's design uh, of a pocket transistor radio many years before, which looks almost identical. <clears throat> it wasn't the technology either. You know, um, Steve Jobs talked about riding the wave of technology, and he was certainly absolutely you know, astute to technology advances. And in fact, there was this Toshiba drive that came out just before the iPod came out, and he wanted to use that drive. And he also wanted to have a really fast connector so that you could upload your stuff to your iPod really fast. But in fact, you know, these were just incremental advances. And way before the iPod, there was a device built by digital called the Personal Jukebox, which was not much bigger. And it had a 5 gigabyte drive. And so technology was not what, what was responsible. So what was responsible? Again, a fundamental change in the scenario. So the way that you used an MP3 player prior to the iPod was that first you'd have to do these nasty red things. You had to download a pirated track you know, with Napster or whatever, or you had to rip your CD collection, which was a very tedious business. Then you had to upload it to your iPod. And then finally, you could play the thing.
And what Steve Jobs realized was that there needed to be a simple streamlined scenario in which you could buy a song pl and play the song. You could play it locally, and then you could synchronize the device on which you bought the song with your iPod and then play it on the iPod. And that means, of course, that iTunes was an important member of the supporting cast in this success. And iTunes came out shortly after the iPod itself. And in fact, if you look at the sales um, of the iPod, what you really see is that the sales of the iPod really take off big time after iTunes has sold 100 million songs. So iTunes becomes really well established. And it's really at that point that everybody decides that they need an iPod. Of course, the iPod disappears into the, into the shrouds of, you know, uh, of the past. Uh, you know, because we have iPhones now, uh, which are much more capable and powerful and, you know, capacious devices and so on. I happen to think that it's sad that we, we don't have this lovely little device anymore. I thought the shuffle was super cute. Uh, and no one, as far as I know, is making a phone this size. Phones just seem to be getting bigger. Story number three, WhatsApp. So what was novel about WhatsApp? You can sort of get the pattern here, right? Well, it wasn't what a lot of people think. It wasn't free texting, right? Because there were companies that had produced free texting uh, and free phone calls before that. And if you look at the growth of, of, of WhatsApp, you see that there was a single big moment. And that big moment was about there in 2011 when things really took off. And what happened at that point was that WhatsApp introduced group chat. So what was so significant about, and, and if you look at the, 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 the uh, derivative, you can see much more clearly how groups were, the group chat feature corresponded to that crucial point of explosion of WhatsApp. A lot of people, by the way, who only knew you know, WhatsApp later think end-to-end -end encryption was a big deal, because that sort of came to be known as a key feature uh, of WhatsApp. But as you can see, end-to-end -end encryption comes in much later when the growth of WhatsApp has really stabilized. And it turns out that groups were a really hot thing back in 2011. Here's an example of, a, you know, of an article from the New York Times saying, everybody's doing groups. It's the coolest thing on earth. So what was so cool about groups? It seems so obvious and natural to us now. Well, what was so cool was that before the notion of groups, right, if you wanted to engage a number of people in a conversation, then on every single message, you had to add the recipients, right? And every time someone new added was added to the call, you had to remember to include them as well. In the group scenario, instead, all that happens is they, and them, they're represented here, the other people by the yellow boxes, they simply spontaneously decide to join the conversation, and all subsequent messages are sent to them. And so, what you're seeing again is a dramatic change in usability by switching from a scenario that has inconveniences in it to a, a much simpler scenario. And it's that scenario that's responsible for the, much, you know, for the great uptake of the, of the technology. Story number four, Zoom. So this was fun, actually. So I, I looked online to see if I could find stats about the growth of Skype and Zoom. And I found this picture. Of, of Skype usage um, from a site called Statistica. Uh, and I thought, wow, that looks a little strange. And then I realized there are asterisks from 2018 onwards. And it turns out that that was the projected growth of Skype. It's still online. You can still find this picture. Um, as we all know, in fact, this was not Skype's happy story. That, in fact, what happened instead was this, that basically Skype and everybody else shouldered off and went nowhere. And Zoom completely exploded. That's Zoom in red. Um, and that happened, of course, at the time of, of, of COVID. So what was so remarkable about Zoom? So, um, so here's, by the way, you know, a, uh, uh, you know, this was one of the first you know, Zoom, famous Zoom uh, meetings. Uh, Boris Johnson, the British Prime Minister, was so proud that he was using Zoom that he screenshotted uh, his Zoom call and, you know, and tweeted it out there with the private uh, you know, Zoom ID of the call uh, that at the time was available for everybody in the world to join his cabinet meetings. Um, so, you know, so this was really cool, but what was actually new about video calls? Well, you know, uh, just as, as, as da David was saying, you know, that, that they had video calls you know, back on the internet you know, 30 years before Zoom or whatever, actually turns out that even prior to the internet, there was something called a picture phone uh, in 1964. And of course, there was you know, the Skype in 2009. So video calls were not a novelty of Zoom. 
Um, there were also webcams. You might think, well, how could this actually work? You know, if it wasn't convenient to actually have a webcam on your laptop. But webcams have been around, um, you know, since 1994, and they were already cheap devices. Furthermore, you might say, well, maybe it wasn't so convenient to ship video over the internet. Maybe there were a lot of performance problems. Well, the H.264 video codec, you know, was invented or finalized in 2003. So again, the story was that these things just weren't convenient to use. That if you wanted to use Skype, this was typically what you had to do. First of all, you as the user who wanted to talk to someone had to sign up for the app. OK, not unreasonable. But then the person you were talking to, and they're the red box, they had to sign up for the app as well. You then placed the call, and then you had to add them to the call. And the problem there is that if you wanted to add just one person, and they were already using Skype, and you were talking to them a lot, that was just fine. But if you wanted to add 100 people because you were running some kind of Zoom conference or whatever, this was completely infeasible. Then you could talk, and then you could hang up. That part was fine. Now, to be fair, Skype did have a, um, a group mechanism that allowed you to define a group. But even for the group, you still had to add everybody one at a time to the group to get before you could, uh, before you could start the call. And of course, we know what Zoom did. Zoom did something in a way more complicated, but that turns out to be much simpler, right? Which is that asynchronously, when you create the meeting, what you do is you get a link from creating the meeting, and you can then send that link out of band by email or text or on the phone or whatever you want to do to all the participants, and then they can join in yellow asynchronously. So this idea, I believe, was really crucial to the success of Zoom, and this is why Zoom pushed Skype out of the way. And if you look at the entire history of video conferencing, and there have been so many different applications, and one of the interesting things is that a company is not typically mentioned in this history, uh, and that's the company uh, LogMeIn, which had a product called Join.me. And they had in their product, because they were trying to do an innovator's dilemma, sort of compete with the big players, they wanted to produce really lightweight video conferencing, and they had this idea of a meeting link. And it's that idea of the meeting link and the scenario that I showed you that gets, gets ad adopted by Zoom. In fact, Skype, realizing how badly they needed it, when they saw Zoom using this concept, they did it themselves. But they did it in April 2020, when they'd already lost momentum to Zoom. Uh, and, and because it wasn't the central way of actually making a, a Skype call, I think it was called Meet Now or something, people barely even noticed uh, that Skype had added this crucial feature. And then, by the way, this goes to all the other products. And so Microsoft Teams a couple of years later, realizes that it needs this scenario too. OK, as if I haven't driven the point uh, home enough, uh, one more example, uh, Calendly. So Calendly is being called you know, the four billion docu DocuSign of scheduling, a phenomenally successful company. So how did it do it? Well, the critical idea of Calendly was that you could schedule yourself for a meeting with somebody else. So what that means is, that rather than the normal kind of elaborate and painful scenario, right, in which um, basically the person you're trying to schedule with records their availability and you go to them and you request some slots. You know, what you used to have to do if you wanted to go and get a haircut, right? Uh, and then they say, well, I have 5 o'clock on, on Wednesday. Will that work for you? No, that won't work. Well, how about 10 o'clock on Thursday? Eventually, you find a slot. You select the slot. You confirm it. All this painful stuff. Instead, what Calendly realized was that you could simply have the person providing the slots record their availability, and then the users, the people who were going to actually use those slots, would just select a slot um, and would automatically get a confirmation for it. Um, so this idea of self-scheduling, like a lot of great ideas, in just the same way that Zoom's key idea was not invented by Zoom, this key idea was not invented by Calendly. Um, I'm not sure who it was invented by, but I think it was invented by a company called Acuity. Um, and Acuity had actually built a self-scheduling system that, uh, unlike Calendly, was focused on small businesses, which is perhaps why they didn't grow in the same way. And um, they came up with this self-scheduling scenario, and Calendly then basically simplifies it uh, and, and grows it to the sort of single proprietor market. Uh, and of course, that idea then becomes universal. Google Calendar had something called slots back in 2011, 
which was a much more cumbersome mechanism, a bit sort of more like Skype with respect to Zoom, where you could share calendars with people and you could enter, you know, you could, you could coordinate meetings, but it didn't have this nice feature that a non-user of the calendar could sign up on someone else's calendar. And they added that with something called schedules in, in 2022, I believe. So the crucial idea here is that successful software design often involves identifying a key scenario that changes the way people use the system, that eliminates pain points and constraints and makes the innovation just completely irresistible. And once you have this new scenario, you can't live without it. To use a term that Merrick first invented, it becomes a not-not. It becomes not acceptable to not have it, right? Once you have group chat, you just will not want to send messages in which you have to list every single recipient and keep track of all the recipients on, on every single message. But scenarios aren't the whole story. So if you think about Zoom, for example, it's not just the meeting protocol, right? It's also, for example, that you can have text chat on Zoom, right? So there are actually multiple scenarios gone, going on at the same time. And each of these scenarios is its own kind of innovation. And I call these concepts. So the way I think of a software product is basically a composition of multiple concepts, each characterized by its key scenario. So Zoom, for example, has, of course, the crucial meeting concept, the one I described. But, and of course, it has video channels as well, which is so obvious I didn't describe them. But it has all these many other scenarios too. And to use Zoom, you have to understand each of these concepts and its essential scenarios. You know, some of these are novel. Uh, at least prior to Zoom, people hadn't done the meeting concept with the idea of the link. Some of them are familiar things. So chat, for example, the idea of a chat room goes back decades. And some of them completely basic, like the fact of having an authenticated user. Concepts, by the way, are not features. Right? People often ask this question, well, isn't this just the notion of a feature? They're not features because, first of all, these concepts represent complete coherent functions, not pieces of a function. They're not aspects like the idea of encryption, which can be sort of layered and applied to anything. They're not individual actions like the feature of being able to reassign the host of a call. And they're not user interface features like, for example, the provision of shortcuts. The other thing that's impor important is that concepts are truly composable services, and they don't, they don't rely on any base functionality. When people talk about features, they have in mind that there's some base functionality, and the features are like little tweaks that sit on top of the base functionality. But there doesn't need to be any layering here. These, these concepts are things that you interact with on an equal basis, and there are no dependencies between them, which means that they can be built independently. So how are these put together? Well, in short, the way they're put together is by synchronization. So all we need to say, for example, is that in the chat concept, you join a chat in Zoom when you start the meeting, if you're the, um, if you're the person creating the meeting. And if you're the person not creating the meeting, you join the chat when you join the meeting. And so this idea of synchronization allows us to get away from having any kind of procedure call notion of one concept being superior to another. Now, I don't have a lot of time to talk about this. Um, so I'll just say that when you actually come to design a concept, there's a lot more to say um, beyond just this scenario. And in particular, you might want to consider details like, well, which messages can a user actually read in a chat? And if you want to do that, you might need, for example, to decide whether or not a user can view messages that have been previously um, previously displayed prior to them actually joining the chat. And for that, we need to design the state and we need to be explicit about these things. This, by the way, I believe is actually a serious design flaw because it's quite an inconvenience when you join a, a Zoom chat that you can't see, for example, any preliminary notes that were sent out. So how many of these fundamental concepts are there in a product that you need to actually differentiate it from other products. Well, some products just have one key concept, and I'd argue that Zoom and WhatsApp are like that. Some products have a whole huge number of concepts. You consider something like Photoshop or you know, Quark Express that are just piles of complex ideas that are developed over time. And some actually have no new concepts at all. They basically just combine existing concepts in often a quite creative way. Uh, and sometimes they do it even by taking, this is Hacker News, they do it by taking a bunch of concepts you've seen, posts and comments and sessions and upvotes and favorites and karma and so on, 
but putting them together in a way that's tuned to a particular kind of domain. So I want to say a little bit about how you apply all this stuff. Um, first of all, you can use it to diagnose usability problems. Here's one of my favorite ones. Um, poor old Melania Trump, on seeing a rather rude tweet about her in which she was made fun of for brushing away her husband's hand uh, in a famous video at an airfield somewhere, um, she rather unfortunately liked this tweet. Um, and people were a little puzzled about why she'd done this. But in fact, it was not her fault. It was Twitter's fault. And the problem was that Twitter had actually played around with the whole notion of likes and had explained in a completely incoherent way what these likes were about. We know that at times the star could be confusing. You might like a lot of things, but not everything can be your favorite. What does this mean? The problem was that there were two fundamental concepts with different scenarios at hand here. One was upvote, basically saying, I want that item to be ranked more, and everybody can see that. And the other was bookmark, save this for me to visit later. And of course, Melania Trump thought she was dealing with bookmark when in fact she was dealing with upvote. And, and that was the nature of the problem. And Twitter, in fact, fixed it later. Uh, in addition to this, the like, which was really the upvote, they eventually, albeit buried rather deeply, because it doesn't, this gets back to David's point about power and money, because it doesn't serve their financial interests, they eventually provided a bookmarking feature in a deep inner menu uh, that allowed you, strangely, under sharing, uh, to share a tweet you know, to, to yourself, uh, which essentially allowed you to sa save it for later. A second thing you can do with this idea is you can catalog your concepts. And I don't have a lot of time to tell you about this, except to say that at Palantir, they've done this because they noticed a kind of entropic growth of concepts. And so what they did was they built in their ontology a large graph of about 300 concepts used across all their products. Um, and then they used these to basically think about their products across not only different divisions and different roles, but they used it also to think about the career path of, pro of product managers. So basically, they gave product managers ownership over individual concepts that crossed across application boundaries. So what that meant was they could in, that these product managers could ensure that a particular concept was actually deployed consistently in different products. And the, the impacts they anticipate from that are basically getting more reuse, getting more consistency, uh, and basically having greater alignment of understanding uh, across the whole company. You can get better reuse. Um, this is uh, an example from PowerPoint. So those of you who use PowerPoint, I don't honestly understand why anyone uses PowerPoint if they have a Mac, because it's, it's, to be honest, so inferior to Keynote. And this is just one mm. example. It has this completely baroque and complicated notion of sections, which they invented, which is a complicated way of dividing your slide deck into pieces, which has a lot of complicated commands. It's very hard to understand. If you look at Keynote, all they have instead is this kind of nudge to the right or the left. And why is that so easy to use? Because it's a tree outline. And we're completely familiar with that concept. It's completely standard, and, and Apple simply chose to reuse it. More modular implementation. If you break things down into concepts, then you can actually build the concepts as, as separate modules. And that's exactly what we teach in our software development class to our undergraduates. And my student, um, Santiago Perez de Rosso, in his thesis a few years ago, showed that um, if you do this, you can actually pre-build all the concepts in advance and then build applications by essentially just sort of writing glue, sort of HTML-style glue that basically glues these concepts together and produces the behavior uh, of an emerging application from the composition of familiar concepts. And we're now doing some new, some new work on this. I have a project with Kevin Sullivan looking at weaving together different concepts. Uh, and with um, an MEng and some Europe's of mine um, looking at using LLMs uh, both to generate concepts and these synchronizations between them. Uh, this is a, just a screenshot from Santiago's work that shows across the top a list of final projects from our class and how he was able basically to build those projects from a list of standard concepts uh, going down the left-hand side. And here, I think, is the final thing I want to, to point out, which is that when you start thinking about things in terms of standard concepts, something interesting happens, which is that you start to look at things in a more general way, 
and that tends to make your applications more flexible. So the standard concept design move is that you start with a single, simple use case, something, some requirement, but you don't implement that use case. Instead, what you do is you consider generalizing it with a concept. So for example, you want to break your slides into subsets. So you say, well, what about tree line, uh, tree outlines, right? Once you have tree outlines, you have unbounded depth, you have all kinds of other features, right? Another example, in Hacker News, right, they have a rule that you can't downvote until you've upvoted some number of times. Well, you could just burn that into the notion of upvoting. But much better, you could say, there's a general concept of karma here, which is that you accrue points for certain kinds of good behavior that you can then spend, right? And once you have that, you can do much more flexible things. Suppose you want in your app to send an email. You've got a, you know, a question and answer app, and you want to email a questioner when there's an answer. Well, don't embed that in the precise details, right? Recognize that this is an example of a notification. And if you build a generic notification concept, you can let the user control what they're going to be notified about. Um, how about in, you know, in MailChimp, for example, there's all this Baroque stuff about setting the default paragraph style, right? because they don't have a style concept that we're familiar with from Microsoft Word and Pages and so on. OK, um, I'm going to skip this in the interest of time. But the key point is that you get much more powerful and flexible and modular systems building this way. I want to close, actually, by showing you something which I think is, is, is even cooler than that, which is that sometimes when you put concepts together, you get a curious kind of synergy. So here's my favorite example, which is, the composition of the trash concept and the folder concept. Now, this might seem bizarre to you because you might think, how could they ever be separate? But in fact, in early implementations of the trash in Microsoft Windows, the trash was not a folder. And when you moved a folder, when you deleted a folder, it disaggregated it into individual files. But by treating the folder, the trash rather, as a folder, you get all kinds of benefits. But it turns out that's actually really a subtle design. And one of the reasons it's a subtle design is because the trash has to hold items from multiple volumes. So it turns out that the trash is the only folder that's sortable by volume, which is a kind of a weird thing. Furthermore, a really cool thing they did, notice that in the Mac, there's no date deleted. You don't need date deleted if you've, if you've got a date added metadata field in every folder. Um, Here's another really cool synergy in Moira, which is this very nice email uh, system um, developed at MIT. You can basically create a mailing list by listing a bunch of people's names. And the question was, what if you want the mailing list to be owned by more than one person, right? So for example, you've got like a professor and the professor's assistant, and you want them both to be able to change the list. Well, you could complicate the design by saying, let's allow multiple owners. But they did a much cooler thing, which was they said, well, let's let a list be an owner. And what kind of list? Well, how about a mailing list, right? So this is a kind of beautiful sort of eating your own tail. It's not, again, without complications, because it turns out that this means, for example, you have to be able to say you know, that there are some mailing lists that are not mailing lists, right? Because you don't want every administrative list to be used as a mailing list. And it also turns out there's a really weird thing which is that um, Moira mailing lists allow you to have email addresses of people who aren't MIT users. And if you create an admin list, all of whose members are non-users, it will let you do it, but you're actually now totally hosed, because now nobody can administer that list. Um, uh, my final example, I think, labels in Gmail. So here's, again, a beautiful example of a synergy. We've got the notion of a label, which is a simple concept for filtering things. When you click on that sent button uh, to see the sent messages, all you're seeing are the messages that have had a sent label attached to them. And the beauty of this scheme is that now, for example, if I want to search for all the items that I'm labeled to do and are in the trash, I don't need special features for saying what's in the trash. I can just use this trash label that was automatically attached. And the mother of all synergies uh, is Photoshop. Um, and uh, I think I'm running out of time, so I'm, I'm going to uh, leave for, uh, for offline discussion to tell you about all my enthusiasm for how amazing it is that Photoshop managed essentially to make selections and masks and channels all the same thing. So the takeaways from this. You know, Mitch Kapoor said, when you go to design a house, you don't go to an engineer, you go to an architect. And the reason for that is 
is that the criteria for what makes a good building fall outside the domain of engineering. And what we need is people who can think about the selection of the various components uh, and, of course, their shaping. And that's what software designers do. So what I've suggested is a new way to think about software in which scenarios point to the authentic demand that you need. And by identifying constraints and pain points, you can come up with new scenarios in which these scenarios sometimes characterize applications, but more often they characterize the concepts that are the central components of the applications. Um, applications are then compositions of these concepts, and by thinking in those terms, you get greater flexibility in reuse and modularity. Um, and that's what my book is about, shameless plug. Um, and uh, on my website, you'll find lots of um, blog posts and tutorials and rants and why I think actually Zoom is in some respects a little broken after all, um, the notion of dark concepts, um, and people often ask about conceptual models. Uh, and I talk a little bit about uh, why I think conceptual models are not the same thing as concepts.